Hello, I'm Pastor Chuck Seilstad, Senior Pastor of Center Points Christian Fellowship. We're now in part two of the Rapture of the Church Studies, where we're looking at the timing of the Rapture. In this study, we're looking at the list of differing viewpoints in our upcoming lessons, where I'm going to cover the various views that people have concerning the Rapture, and we'll give them a fair examination, even though I don't adhere to them. Now, I will periodically place in notes to clarify some points of the literal and orthodox view of the scripture to ground ourselves and keep us balanced in our learning. Now, I always want to start off with a series of teaching on the rapture, saying that I have the view of the rapture that I personally subscribe to that I believe is the most consistent with a literal interpretation of biblical prophecy. I believe that there is only one rapture event, and it's the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, people may disagree with that, and that's okay. I'm not going to argue about it, and, and I don't think any of us should argue about what we believe. We just know what we believe. And see, the pre-tribulation rapture view points to the prophetic chronological clues that, they be, that all of us believe that indicate that the rapture will take place prior to the tribulation period. When I say all of us, I'm talking about those that believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, today we're completing the study of the partial and the multiple rapture viewpoints, which I've shortened the name and just called them partialists to make the narrative flow easier, before we move on to another viewpoint about the rapture. Now, picking up from our last lesson, we left off talking about the partialist idea of many multiple raptures that, that a lot of the partialist and multiple raptures believe in because they believe in seven raptures. Now, I'm going to give you an extra one that's a little different, but uh, I'm going to focus right now on the seven main uh, raptures they believe in. The partialists say that the rapture refers to the living believers being caught up to heaven, whereas the resurrection refers to the dead being raised to life, so they're alive again, so then they can be raptured. Now, I just want to throw in a little note here that that's not what the, really, I don't believe what the Bible says about uh, the difference between the living and the, and the believers. Yes, the living believers and the dead, the Bible says, will rise together and meet the Lord in the air and, and they'll be changed. So we'll meet the, the dead believers uh, in the air when we are raptured that are alive. But they say the living believers get caught up into heaven, but the dead ones will be raised to life then they're raptured. Well, um, well, we'll go on from here. So the idea is both cases, the living are caught up or raptured. So many of the proponents of the partial or multiple rapture theory say there are at least seven raptures found in the Bible. They say that three have already happened and four more will happen soon. As some even teach, there'll be even more raptures as people are martyred or as groups of people accept Jesus into their hearts and are purified by the trials of the tribulation. Now, the following chronological list of the raptures will give us a clear view of how the partialist belief system coalesces into a doctrine. I've mentioned a couple of them, but we'll go through them all together so we can look at it as a whole of what their doctrine teaches. Now, the first rapture. They say the first rapture was Enoch was the first person to be raptured by God. Partialists say that Enoch is a great type of the first fruits rapture. See, Enoch lived 365 years walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day, he just disappears. He's walking along and he disappears because God took him. And it was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He, disappe he disappeared because God took him. You see that. But it doesn't say that he died and was resurrected. Uh, it says that he was just taken up. It, therefore, he was taken up and he was known as a person who pleased God. And a study of Enoch reveals the characteristics, they, the partialists say, of the Christian Gentile who will be accounted worthy to participate in the first fruits rapture. And it's significant that we know absolutely none of the physical facts of his life. There is not one single outstanding event recorded in the life of Enoch. He was raptured, they say, out of profound obscurity into heaven because his works must have been so great that he earned the right to walk with God. Now note, as I've, I've said in previous lessons, we can never earn a right to be with God. He's the one who gives us the gift of heaven and eternal life. And I also want to point out again it doesn't say that he died. It said he was taken. It doesn't say he was changed. It gives us no clue about that. So I want, I want to point that out. Now, now, the second rapture, the partialists say, was Elijah. They said he was the second person to be raptured. 
because they describe Elijah as being raptured because of his works. Now, as Elisha and Elijah were walking along and taking, you know, talking about different things, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. And, and understand something, some people mistakenly say that Elisha or Elijah was taken up uh, in a fiery uh, chariot. He was not. The fiery chariot divided the two men, and then Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind. See, what it did was it, it drove between the two men, separating them, and then Elijah was carried up, as I said, by a whirlwind into heaven. And the story of Elijah and Elisha, clearly what the partialists say, shows the differences in the raptures that will take place. The primary Old Testament type or symbol for the first fruits rapture is Elijah and Elisha walking along together when a fiery chariot, that is the picture of judgment, they say, separated them and Elijah was taken up by a whirlwind into heaven because he was righteous. And it's important to note that they say that Elisha uh, immediately rent, literally tore his clothes, which is a symbol of repentance. The partialists say that Elisha had to repent because he wasn't righteous enough to be taken with Elijah. And so they say Elisha is a symbol of Christians missing the first fruits rapture and will have to go through part of the tribulation period before earning the right to be raptured. He said it's also highly significant that Elisha refused to talk about the coming rapture of his mentor, Elijah. Now, this, they say this is a, like a great majority of the church today who refuse to talk about the fulfillment of prophecies and the soon coming rapture. They say that this proves they are fa that they are failing to watch for the return of Jesus and they will be left behind just like Elisha. Now, let me say this. This is a note. This does not prove that Elijah and Elisha are examples of several raptures. It's totally conjecture on the part of the partialists. Elisha continued on with the ministry that God had given Elijah uh, while he was here on earth. I mean, as a blessing to Elisha's faithfulness, God increased his ministry twofold to that of Elijah, not punishing him for not going up with Elisha, uh, with Elijah, but, uh, but blessing him. So this cannot be an example uh, of two raptures. Now, the third rapture, they say, is Jesus. He was resurrected, resurrected, excuse me, and then raptured to heaven. Well, Ma Matthew 28, 5 through 6 says, but the angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where he lay. Now Jesus was raptured by being taken up, they say, to heaven in his resurrected body in the presence of his disciples occurring 40 days after his resurrection. But in the biblical narrative, an angel tells the watching disciples that Jesus' second coming will take place in the same manner as his ascension. But they don't really say the second coming, they say the rapture. Now, I, I, no, I need to say that this is about the first three events that are considered raptures by the partialists. I want to, I want to talk about these for just a second. They are not considered a rapture in the true sense by the orthodox view of the church. Now, yes, all three were taken up to heaven, but nowhere in the Bible does it say that Enoch and Elijah were given immortal bodies at that time, which that is what happens at a resurrection. It was one thing like um, uh, Lazarus and them coming back to life. That wasn't really a resurrection. He brought them back to life. But a resurrection is living for eternity and they are in immortal bodies. It does not say that Enoch and Elijah received immortal bodies. See, because God may have another purpose for both of them coming back alive and then they too would die. But see my teaching on the tribulation about that. But And I may mention it a little bit more in a few minutes. But it's believed that Enoch and Elijah are still living in their mortal bodies for now. But they do not corrupt or die because they're in God's presence. See, Jesus was, was, was resurrected from, and given his immortal body and was taken up to heaven. But he wasn't raptured and transformed. He was already alive in his immortal body when he went up. See, it's a misinterpretation of scriptures by the partialists because it is talking about the second coming of Christ, which is not the rapture. It's a separate event. 
It's not a representation of the rapture. As I said, it is a separate event. That verse is talking about the second coming of Christ. Now, okay, let's look at the fourth rapture, which is the first fruits rapture, also known as the overcomer's rapture. Now, we've already discussed this in particular rapture in length, but I need to mention it in order to show the raptures that the partialists uh, view and how they view them in chronological order. The partialists say that these are the Christians who are worthy to be taken up before the, the tribulation begins because of their Christian works. They say believers will be standing side by side with other saved individuals who are still immature believers. They say that Elijah and Elisha are examples of where ready Christians are taken, leaving the immature believers behind. They say these are the clear types of the first fruits rapture of mature believers, with the rapture of the overcomers uh, will it consist of at least two categories. The dead overcomers in resurrection who were deserving of the rapture and the living overcomers and those who have never passed through death who have proved their worthiness. So they've earned it. See, the partialists remind us that all Christians who have ever died, they were found worthy through their works and position in Christ. And those Christians who are still alive with the same set of qualifications when the trumpet is blown will go in this rapture. At the rest of the non-rapture believers, they say, living and dead will miss this particular event. They will have to wait until later to be raptured in the main harvest rapture. Okay, now, the fifth rapture they believe in. The 144,000 first fruits are taken up to heaven. See, they say the next important rapture of the partialists is teaching that the 144,000 witnesses that are found in the book of Revelation... Uh, they are the 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel and are sealed with the seal of God. And, and see, they get some of these things right, but they twist it to fit their particular doctrine. They say they'll be witnesses uh, to earth so that many people can come to the Lord through their preaching and influence during this period, which they will. And the Bible says that a great choir sing a wonderful new song in front of the throne of God before the 24 living beings and the 24 elders. Now remember, they said that the living beings and the 24 elders are the same people and that this represents all of the Christians that are raptured in the first fruits rapture. But that the Bible doesn't say that part. I just have to throw that inject, interject that in there. But they say, and the Bible says, no one could learn this song except the 144,000 who have re been redeemed from the earth. And they've kept themselves as pure as virgins, following the Lamb wherever He goes. And they've been purchased from among the people on the earth as a special offering to God and to the Lamb. And here's where they get off track again. They say, because of their works here on earth, Christ will rapture them to heaven before His wrath falls on the earth. Now, now let me put a note here. Let's look at what really happens to the 144,000. Are they ultimately martyred? Are they raptured? Uh, are they in due course miraculously rescued? Uh, do they go through the entire tribulation period unscathed? Well, the book of Revelation doesn't say, leaving their exact fate somewhat ambiguous. Nevertheless, it does say that they are preserved and end up standing before the Lamb on Mount Zion. And it may, be, it may not be clear what happens to the 144,000 during the tribulation, but in the first verses of Revelation 14, is it apparent that their mission is finished and it can be seen that everything is more than all right with them. Some scholars think that the 144,000 are standing before the Lord during Christ's future earthly kingdom during the millennium. Others think they are standing before him in the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, what are the 144,000 doing before the Lord? Well, they're worshiping him and singing a praise song pertinent only to them. And during this scene of heavenly praise and adoration, John hears a voice similar to the sound of many waters and great thunder. And John described the, the magnificent sound of God's voice as the mighty waves of ocean and thunder. And this appears that they will be in heaven before the end of the tribulation. We know the 144,000 are from the 12 tribes of Israel. They accept Christ as their Savior during the tribulation period. 
We don't know precisely what happens to the 144,000 in life, whether in the long run they were martyred or delivered by some way before God, but the Bible doesn't say they are raptured. Now, let's look at the sixth rapture, the main harvest rapture. Again, we've discussed this one in our lessons on this viewpoint. <clears throat> but to be consistent, I need to mention it here in the order of the partialist and multiples doctrine. This is where the rapture of the majority of the believers will happen. Just before the wrath of God is poured out on the earth, they were, they were already saved at the time of the tribulation began, but they had not yet matured to the point of being ripe for the first harvest and had not earned their right to go in that first one. And this is what the partialists say. And they're saying these are two groups who are taken up in the rapture of the majority of believers. The first group is the resurrected saints, those that died before the tribulation began, and they were not called up in the first fruits rapture. The second group consists of people, that, of believers who are alive and have remained on the earth, who were Christians before the tribulation, but they had not shown that they were worthy to go up in the first fruits rapture. So we know about these as well. So I need to point that out. Now, the seventh rapture. God's two witnesses are raptured to heaven. Remember I talked about the two witnesses, if you've seen my um, teaching on, on the uh, tribulation period. But God's two witnesses, they say, are then raptured to heaven. The scriptures say that God will give power to his two witnesses, and they will be clothed in burlap and will prophesy during a 1,260-day period of, of, of that time frame around three and a half years. It says no one will be able to harm them. No one will want, you know, they won't try or they will try, but it won't work because no matter what they do, especially when they try to kill them, they themselves will be killed. But when they complete their testimony work, the beast comes up out of the bottomless pit later on, you know, and you, we find all that out, but the beast will, will then come and he'll declare war against them and he'll conquer them and kill them. See, this is part of what it talks about in Revelation. And for three and a half days, all the different people of the world, uh, the tribes, the languages, and the nations will stare at their bodies. See, it sounds like the world news media channels will be broadcasting nonstop. We see that on the internet now. I mean, you think of this several years ago, this was not possible. <coughs> Excuse me. But it was. it's possible now to be able to see anything non-stop you know they have webcams they have all kinds of things so they'll be able to see this all over the world and no one will be able to bury them and the two men will lie unburied in the streets of jerusalem and the people from many of the nations will look at their corpses and they'll party they'll have joy in the, in their lives they'll be super happy they'll celebrate and send gifts to each other glad because they're no longer tormented by the two witnesses who preached the truth of Christ's testimony. Now, <laughs> this sounds like Amazon.com will be very busy. At the Amazon Prime members, they'll be able to get same-day delivery when they send their, their packages to people. Plus, all the shippers around the world will be busy getting packages moved from one place to another, all in celebration of these two people being killed. It'll be so convenient for people to do this, which was never possible before this time that we're living in now. But after three and a half days, God breathes life into them and they stand up. They become alive again. They are resurrected. <clears throat> Terror will strike everyone who has been staring at them. And then a loud voice from heaven calls to the two prophets, come up here. And they will rise to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watch. And the partialists say, and that, and that part will take place, but the partialists say, they're going to be raptured up into heaven because of their mighty works. Because of what they did and how much work they did, now they're worthy to be raptured. Now, no, remember I mentioned that Enoch and Elijah may still be living in their mortal bodies? Well, many theologians believe that the two witnesses in the book of Revelation may be Enoch and Elijah. See, because they've never died, and the Bible never says that they died. It never says that they were resurrected. It never says that they received immortal bodies. <clears throat> and early Christian writers such as Tertullian, Irenaeus, Hippolytus and, and, and of Rome, and uh, they've all concluded that two of the witnesses, the two witnesses that will be there during Revelation, would be Enoch 
and Elijah, the two prophets who did not die because God took them according to other biblical passages. Now, when the Bible speaks about the rapture, the believers are changed and given immortal bodies. It doesn't say they're given immortal bodies and then they're raptured. It doesn't say this happens to these two men. And I'm not saying that these two witnesses are definitely uh, Enoch and Elijah, but the two witnesses of the book of Revelation will be uh, killed and then they'll be lifted up. And, and it's an interesting theory and it's, and it's not totally unbelievable. I mean, it's believable and acceptable because you remember these two guys have been in the presence of God for thousands of years. And if it's them that comes back, man, I'm going to tell you, they're going to be full of power and authority and know what they're doing. <clears throat> so it, it is believable and acceptable that it could be them. I'm just not saying it is. I'm not going to commit to that because the Bible doesn't say. Now, I do want to give another viewpoint of the rapture by some partialists. It's not part of the seven. It's not counted with the other seven raptures. <clears throat> but the multiple raptures of the that, that are also going to take place that they believe, and it's a it's a smaller majority or minority, excuse me, of these partialist and multiplist raptures, they believe in what's called the Bride of Christ raptures. <clears throat> this is another view of that is obscure, and it's not widely held by many people, but we do find that some partialists and multiplists believe in the Bride of Christ raptures. Now, earlier on in my ministry, I was handed a pamphlet called The Bride of Christ Rapture. And it was written by a woman who was an American missionary to China and was captured by the Japanese forces and held in a prison of war camp for the rest of World War II. While she was there, she thought through this and came up with this particular idea, along with a couple other people that have had it, and although it has some backing by some people, it is not a major belief in churches around the world, even amongst the partials and multiplists. But the doctrine reveals that depending on how good of a person is, how good of a Christian uh, is determined when they will be raptured. Kind of sounds like the, you know, the uh, first fruits and the main harvest rapture. But basically this includes all almost all the views of the rapture held by people throughout history and is also included in my teachings on this subject. In brief, in a brief summary, the Bride of Christ Rapture's doctrine states that the better Christian a person is, a person is preparing for the rapture, they'll go in one of them. So the better they are, the sooner they go. And see, they believe these raptures will occur daily or periodically beginning with the pre-tribulation rapture all the way through the end of the tribulation period prior to the second coming of Christ. So there could be, you know, hundreds of raptures is what they believe in. Their doctrine teaches that the Apostle Paul won't be raptured until probably later during the tribulation uh, because of his persecution of the early church before becoming a Christian. See, they quote 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to prove their point. Uh, 1, Corinthians 15, uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians 15, 9. It says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now, let me note here. There is no scriptural proof that this doctrine is valid. None whatsoever. I cannot find it anywhere that there are multiple hundreds of raptures. Also, 1 Corinthians 15, 9 is being taken out of context and has nothing to do with the rapture. It is Paul speaking from his humility. See, 1 Corinthians 15, 9 needs to be partnered with 1 Corinthians 15, 10. It says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. See, Paul is comparing his work as an apostle with the other apostles, not referring to going up in the rapture. So that whole point about the Bride of Christ rapture is just not scriptural. And the rejection of the partial multiple rapture theory. That's what I'm going to get into now. I want to let you know why I do not believe in this, this partial or multiple rapture theory that, that, that these believers 
have. I, I just need to give you that information. So most evangelicals reject the partial multiple rapture theory for the following reasons. First, a misinterpretation of proof texts. Most of the partial rapturous proof texts are incorrectly interpreted to deal with the rapture. Instead, it deals with the second coming of Christ, a lot of the ones that they use. Other texts simply describe the positional sanctification of every believer, and they misinterpret the Philippians passage that describes Paul's desire to excel, not just to be present at the rapture. The next thing that I, I rejected for is the works principle versus grace. The partial rapture theory based on a works principle. That's what it's, it's based on works. Adversely, it affects the doctrine of soteriology, or in other words, soteriology is the doctrine of salvation. The partial rapture view is based upon a work principle in opposition to scriptural teaching on grace. Uh, to accept a works principle for this important aspect of salvation is to undermine the whole concept of justification by faith through grace. The partial rapturalists confuse the distinction between law and grace. If exception of the wrath of God were conditional uh, of, the, of the works of man, it, it, it just can't be right. See, if the exception of the wrath of God were conditional upon the works of man, as the partial rapturists would have us believe, then that would mean they have removed the law of unconditional grace. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now let me say that passage again. I'm going to use the English Standard Version on this one. Titus 3, 5 through 7. It says, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I mean, that's it. Nothing more. We are justified by his grace. Nowhere in Scripture is it said that our salvation is a product of an individual's works. Therefore, the born-again result can't itself be a product works. Remember, James says faith without works is dead, what he is saying is that if we have faith, we will have works. But we don't do works to earn something. We do it because it naturally comes out of our salvation. Salvation requires nothing more than the acceptance of God's grace through heartfelt repentance and the belief and devotion to Christ Jesus as required in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Another reason why I reject the, uh, the partialist view is the dividing of the body of Christ. The scripture pictures the body of Christ as one unit. Now, it talks about different parts of the body. You know, as far as some people, uh, they have works and of, of helps, and some uh, have uh, you know, prophecy and other things like that. But it shows that we're all one body, one unit. If a division is indicated, it's usually between true and false believers, not a, vis a division between true believers. But partial rapturists further divide the true believers into two categories, worthy and unworthy believers. Now this splits the body of Christ instead of keeping it as one body. There is no scriptural justification for dividing the unity of the body of Christ, joined in union with Christ and all fellow believers. See, a division such as partial rapturists teach is unthinkable in the view of the doctrine of one body. This view destroys the unity of the body of Christ. And Romans 12, 4 through 5 says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, as I was saying earlier. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Remember, the scripture tells us the body of Christ is many parts, but one body. Another reason why I reject their teaching is ignoring biblical definitions. The partial rapturous position ignores the plain teaching of the scriptures concerning the translation of all true believers when the, this event takes place. 
The rapture passages picture an all-inclusive coverage of believers, not a division. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, we all. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 says, if we believe Jesus died and rose again. I mean, that's a cardinal belief. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, dead in Christ. Also in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 10, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 11. Now, then we can see in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 10, whether we are awake or asleep, this could contextually be translated as whether we watch or are unwatchful. Another thing that they do is they ignore questions. If unprepared living believers must go through the tribulation, then logically unprepared dead believers must also be in some kind of purgatory. They're hanging out somewhere because they're not with the Lord, which goes against where the Bible says to be with to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. Nowhere does the Bible teach a purgatory, a holding place for the uh, for the um, uh, the believers. See, there was a place called paradise. There was a, a portion or a, a part of hell that was separated uh, by a gulf, a, a basically a bottomless pit. One side was the wicked dead, the other side was the righteous dead. But when Jesus died on the cross, went down and took the keys of hell and death from Satan, he led those people, the captive, he took, led captivity captive, he took them to heaven. Now, what Paul says is to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So there is no holding place. See, it, 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 their belief system could also mean that their souls are sleeping, like soul sleep. But this is never really explained by the partialists. And we've already shown that there is no scriptural foundation for soul sleep. It just doesn't exist. Logically, if the partial rapturalists are correct, then there would be some that are dead in Christ that would not measure up to being worthy of God, bringing them up to heaven in the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 So certainly then, Paul would not have told us that we would all be changed in 1 Corinthians 15.51. Think of that. He says we all shall be changed. Not some, not a portion, not a partial amount of people. He says we shall all be changed in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. The partial multiple rapture theory leaves some large holes in their teaching. So large holes. When answers to questions don't fit within their theology, they are, are ignored or left unexplained. And another one, the destruction of the believer's imminent hope. This is another reason why I disagree with their doctrine. The destruction of the believer's imminent hope. The partial rapture view destroys the imminent hope of the return of Christ for all believers. To the partial rapturists, it doesn't matter if we're waiting for the rapture to take place because we won't go if we're not good enough Christians when Christ calls the faithful home. And the problem with that is that no one knows. And if there is a, uh, a, a rapture earlier before the tribulation period, you can pretty much count when the next one's gonna happen. And that's not scriptural. It doesn't line up with, with the verses that it talks about, the rapture. So, you know, it's another reason to reject it. Another one that I reject their belief system is reward versus promise. The rapture is never presented as a reward for godly living through works in the scripture. It's the hope of the believer and the promise of the Lord to be with him forever when he calls for us. The rapture is not based on an earned merit award system. It's a believing in, uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's a blessing that is promised to all believing Christians, not just a faction of people who are worthy. And another is the that I rejected for is spiritualization and hidden meaning. Spiritualization and hidden meanings. The partialists use an overt amount of spiritualization of the scriptures. They find hidden meanings that are that an exegesis, which is a critical explanation of in, or, an, or an interpretation of a text. So when we find that uh, the, hidden, the hidden meanings, when we do an exegesis of the scripture, a passage of scripture, it will reveal, reveal that what they believe is false. Let me say that again. Finding hidden meanings that an exegesis of a passage will reveal that it's false when we look at how they interpret it. Because when we critically examine their interpretation of the text, we find out that it is not what it's saying. 
See, they take great liberties to explain some scriptures and ignore others. And then they take a lot out of context and they put them all together. See, if a scripture contradicts their teaching, they say the passage doesn't mean what we're saying it means, or they're just in misinterpreting or missing the real meaning of the scripture. That's what they say if we disagree with them. And their defense of this view is incorrectly based on a few passages which refer to Israel during the tribulation period. We see that in Luke 21, 36, Matthew 24, 41 through 42, and Matthew 25, 1 through 13. So they say these scriptures that refer to Israel during the tribulation period, the partialist view, which are based on a false distinction between believers. See, they, they take these out of context and they, when we're looking at, at it meaning one thing, and that's what the author meant when they wrote it, they say it means something else. So their view is based on a false distinction between believers. And then here's the analysis of the, of the partial multiple theory that I want to give you. As, as with the no rapture theory, I believe the conjecture of the partial multiple rapture of the church theory is false as well. And it fails to give a proper explanation of prophecy and its impact on Christians. The examination of the partial multiple uh, rapture theory of the end times leaves many questions unanswered and attempts to give misinterpreted evidence to the meaning of scriptures in order to make its analysis fit into their teaching. The partial rapture view has been embraced by only a small fragment of evangelical Christians and has not been recognized by any particular evangelical Protestant group. It's an interpretation limited to a few and cannot be regarded as within the bounds of normal biblical premillennialism. So now that we've completed this viewpoint uh, number two of the rapture, in our next lesson, we'll begin examining viewpoint number three called the post-tribulation rapture of the church. In other words, that means that it happens at the end of the tribulation period, just before the second coming of Christ. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you that we're able to study and go through the lessons and, and to learn more about what people believe and disbelieve. Lord, help us to be uh, true Christians that rightly divide the word of truth, that we are one body in Christ. We may be different churches, we may be different denominations, but if we believe in you as our personal Savior and Lord, we are the church. Lord, help your church to interpret the Bible correctly. Help us to be able to read and see and understand that you give us knowledge as well as, as the understanding. So I ask that you would bless us as we continue our studies uh, in the rapture and the end times. And we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, you know, thank you for joining in with me with this uh, teaching today. Uh, to find out more about Center Points Christian Fellowship, visit our website at www.centerpoints.org. On our website in the narrative on YouTube and Facebook, in our narrative, you can find a link to our YouTube channel with all our video messages recorded so far, including this one. You can also sign up for our weekly newsletter updates and to find out how to join us for Wednesday night Bible study and, and women's Thursday morning Bible study on Zoom. Just send me an email requesting it at info at centerpoints.org. So until I see you again, stay safe and may God bless you and have a great day.